Good evening and welcome to the College and Complexes. My name is Tim. And between me and Andy, we'll be moderating tonight. Tonight's topic is the Cold War establishment versus JFK. In the 1950s, the so-called Cold War was proceeding apace with the American oligarchy through the CIA, engineering criminal groups and wars in several countries in the name of fighting communism. But John F. Kennedy and in the presidency, we soon began formulating and implementing a, an economic policy in the interest of the American people rather than the corporate elite. B, foreign policy more favorable to world peace than a warmongering, profiteering aims of the military industrial complex. Kennedy thereby incurred the Cold War establishment's deadly wrath. In 19, the 1963 false flag assassination of JSK, JFK, with was thus the culmination of a single titanic struggle within the American state, one whose outcome cemented supremacy of the imperial oligarchy behind and above the year-to-year -year facade of electoral party politics. The American people have been living under this type of tyranny by deception ever since. With the present war on terror being merely its latest incarceration, historian Ted Aranda examines the Eisenhower-Kennedy Cold War period in this slide. Before we get started, I'm going to briefly review two rules for the College of Complexes. One is, and everybody knows this, one fool at a time. The second is no personal attacks. The college consists of the following format. We have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak, then we will have questions and we ask that you ask a question during the question period, and at the end of the question period, each of you will get a chance, usually it's about four minutes long, to rebut with on what the speaker says or just speak your mind. Let's introduce our, uh, give our speaker a warm welcome. It's uh, Ted Randa. <coughs> Come on up. Ted who? Ted Randa. Ted who? We know this guy. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh. <clears throat> okay, I hope you noticed uh, the, the quotes on the screen. They're a little bit enigmatic, they might even seem trivial, but by the end of this presentation, and some of you might already notice, uh, they'll make sense, I think. Uh, another thing I want to let you know is that <clears throat> toward the end, I have a little bit too, too much material, so toward the end, uh, I'll probably be skimming the last section. Okay. <clears throat> In my last presentation on the Cold War, I assert that this phenomenon was not an unavoidable conflict between two great powers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, naturally arising after World War II with both countries aiming at world dominion and therefore inevitably clashing. This is false. In reality, the Soviet Union had no program of world conquest. Only the United States did. So the term Cold War is in fact a misnomer. What the world witnessed in the post-war years was instead a unilateral and deceptive imperial project by the American establishment. In this follow-up presentation, I'll recap the beginnings of the Cold War that I described last time briefly go through several further regional episodes and finally examine the Kennedy presidency and assassination in light of the establishment's Cold War agenda. In the 1920s and 30s, the Morgan and Rockefeller-led Council on Foreign Relations, the political guiding arm of the American establishment, emerged as a major promoter and organizer of U.S. imperialism. <coughs> Excuse me, I always have throat problems or something. In 1942, even before World War II had ended, CFR Director Isaiah Bowman asserted the necessity of the U.S. attaining quote unquote world domination, or rather world control and domination after its victory. CFR member General George Strong uh, further declared that the United States must cultivate a mental view toward world settlement after this war, which will enable us to impose our own terms, amounting to a Pax Americana. 
Those are his words. And I'm sure um, probably all of you know that that, ter that term, Pax Americana, comes from the famous Pax Romana Empire, the Roman Empire, the, the most famous empire in, in the history of the world. That's what they're talking about. <clears throat> this drive for, for world mastery was unique to the United States. The one country that, alone among the world's major combatants, came out of that Armageddon completely unscathed and indeed far wealthier than when it entered it. The U.S.'s behavior was completely independent of anything the Soviet Union did or might do. Did or might do. In fact, the USSR was physically and economically devastated after, after the war and in no condition whatsoever to pursue global ambitions of a kind similar to those of the U.S. Simply put, there was no threat to either the West or the rest of the world. Now, oh my goodness, let me see. I'm probably skipping some um, frames here. <clears throat> there goes your Pax Romana, and that's the Soviet Union after the war. You can find a whole lot of images like that because that's what the country was a lot was like in a lot of places. Now, the actual Im implementation of an American imperial project in any era requires the fabrication of the perception of a threat to the U.S. or to its vital interests, quote unquote. And of course, these vital interests <coughs> seem to populate every square inch of the world, right? Today, as the U.S. Uh, runs rampant in the Middle East, this perception is provided by the completely synthetic phenomenon of terrorism. In the middle of the last century, the necessary facade was provided by something equally fictitious, ruthlessly aggressive Soviet communism. In other words, since there was in actuality no real, organic, more or less equal contest for empire arising out of World War II that would justify American imperialist behavior, a fraudulent one had to be created. When they, they're ready. Key agents in this project were Foster and Alan Dulles, future U.S. Secretary of State and CIA Director. <clears throat> the first step in the charade was the setting up of a boogeyman. It was precisely for this reason that practically overnight, right after the end of the Second World War, Foster Dulles and his imperialist colleagues began, began demonizing the Soviet Union. The very country that had just been the U.S.'s most critical ally in defeating Nazi Germany. Backed up by President Truman, Foster absurdly ranted about a diabolical Soviet threat to free societies, established civilization, and indeed the entire world. In fact, there was no evidence whatsoever of any such thing. It was sheer propaganda. <clears throat> Given the lurid claims by the Americans about the threat to the U.S. Uh, to the world, rather, posed by the USSR. It might seem strange that the U.S. never seriously challenged the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. In fact, it was never its intent to do so. First of all, the quote-unquote evil empire was too entrenched over there in its own realm. Second, the Americans knew all along that it was not actually a menace to other countries. So why bother? Third, and most important, there was the rest of the world to subdue. Of course, in the name of defending quote-unquote democracy. Sovereign countries that did not immediately accede to the American protection racket, called freedom, but actually consisting of U.S. capital penetration and political vassalage, were falsely portrayed as Moscow stooges and thus ripe for corrective action by Uncle Sam, the world's mob boss. It should be noted at this point that if any given country halfway around the world actually did want to be communist or allied with the Soviet Union, what on earth business was that of the United States? None, period. I also want to point out that none of the, these issues of international relations had anything to do with the Soviet Union's internal character, which was a ty tyranny of the first rank. And in fact, I'm going to give a, a presentation on Stalinism um, in a few months. Communist oppression of the Stalinist variety was real, but it was essentially domestic, not international, with only Eastern Europe even being in the Soviet sphere of influence. The first major Cold War conflict was over Korea, which I described in detail last time. <clears throat> what happened there can be encapsulated briefly. Korea was a single, unified country that the U.S. unilaterally and arbitrarily split into two at the end of World War II. The Americans then proceeded to build up a reactionary regime in the South, leading to a civil war between that regime and both the Communist North and the indigenous left in the South. So let me uh, describe what happened here. There's um, the unified Korea, which was like that for centuries. Here comes the US, draws a line in the sand, basically. Lo and behold, all of a sudden, two countries. 
<laughs> then it uh, goes and makes the southern half of that, what was one country, its proxy, okay. its, uh, its own thing. <clears throat> Thank you. This civil war uh, concerned only Koreans, and it would have been easily and relatively bloodlessly won by the North if not for the U.S.'s totally unjustified all-out military intervention. Aside from favorable geostrategic alignments involving a revived, now westernized Japan with South Korea as its economic little brother, the main product of the Korean War for the American establishment was a colossal, regenerated war machine that, whatever else it might do, would henceforth certainly fulfill one of its primary purposes, feeding the coffers of the corporations comprising the military-industrial com uh, complex. So here's what we have. All throughout American history, military spending was a tiny proportion of the, of the military budget. Uh, then you have World War I, which was uh, a nice little blip for the bankers. And then you have World War II, which was a uh, bonanza for bankers. And then the war ended, military spending is, is dying down naturally. Well, we can't have that. Then the North Korea, uh, the, excuse me, the Korean War, the, the military spending goes up into the hundreds of billions again and stays that way since. <clears throat> uh, the next target of the American establishment was Iran, where the US engineered a coup in August of 1953. So now, finally, I'm, I'm getting to new material. <laughs> Hope I haven't bored some of you uh, so far. Um, so there's Iran, and you might notice that uh, Where's the United States on, on that night? The US is not in sight, right? It's on the other side of the world. But that's not going to stop it, right? As, at this time, Iran was under mostly uh, British uh, neo-colonial subjugation. In particular, the AIOC, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, controlled by the British government, and later renamed BP, okay, practically ruled this nominally sovereign nation. In 1951, after having led a nationwide populist movement, the Iranian politician Mohammad Mossadegh became the country's prime minister. He immediately embarked on a policy of limiting foreign influence in Iran. Mossadegh was a quintessential nationalist. The Iranian people, he said, merely desired to lead their own lives in their own way. What a strange concept. Mossadegh demanded full Iranian control of Iranian resources and denounced British ownership of Iran's oil industry. But there was one slight problem with this otherwise perfectly reasonable position. U.S. capital had a major economic interest in Iran in terms of both current involvement and the potential for future oil exploitation. This involvement included the Dulles brothers, who had close financial ties to a number of enterprises immersed in Iran. Most notable among these was an American engineering conglomerate called OCI, Overseas Consultants Incorporated. Alan Dulles, had met the Shah in Iran in 1949 and convinced him to pay OCI $650 million. In today's dollars, that would be half a trillion for a humongous, multifaceted, seven-year project involving hydroelectric plants, rebuilt cities, and entire new industries imported from abroad. Mossadegh understandably denounced this massive intrusion of foreign capital into the nation's infrastructure development. Eventually, Mossadegh won the na nationalization of the country's oil industry and with his parliament, killed the OCI project. The Dulles brothers and the rest of the American establishment therefore set out to destroy most of them. <coughs> now, needless to say, a defense of purely corporate interests, mainly British, is in faraway Iran would not have been very compelling foreign policy to American public opinion. <coughs> So the Dulles brothers applied the strategy of reframing their case for intervention in Cold War terms, warning that, oh my god, 60% of the free world's oil would be controlled by Moscow if Iran were to succumb to communism. This is what they claimed was about to happen. So the Dulleses made most of their god to be a communist stooge that had to be taken care of. But in reality, he was nothing of the sort. In fact, this member of an aristocratic Persian family educated in France and Switzerland, favored capitalist liberalism and had no use for either Marxism or the Iranian Communist Party. The American diplomat George McGee called Mossadegh a patriotic Iranian nationalist with no reason to be attracted to socialism. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas said of Mossadegh that he was a great popular hero 
passionately Persian and anti-Soviet in his leanings, who embraced democratic ideals. For his part, for rather for its part, the Soviet Union was not significantly involved in Iran at all. President Eisenhower endorsed a coup to overthrow the Mossadegh government. The CIA then engineered the coup by bribing, killing, neutralizing, or co-opting all the necessary persons and orchestrating all the necessary dirty tricks. Mossadegh was arrested and imprisoned, and the Shah, and um, I'm sure you all know that Shah is just the Persian word for king, okay, so this is a monarchy, having nothing whatsoever to do with democracy. Um, the Shah had fled, and now he was returned to Iran. Within a few months, the country's oil industry was denationalized, with 40% of it now going to American oil giants such as Texaco and Standard Oil. Iran's representative government was dismantled, and the reign of terror under the Shah began. In this so-called uh, Cold War episode, as we'll see over and over again in others, communism has nothing to do with anything. <coughs> okay, so next up is Guatemala. So there's little Guatemala. There's the big United States, a thousand miles away, right? Guatemala in those days was practically a possession of the very large American company, United Fruit. United Fruit uh, owned huge plantations and either directly or through its affiliates controlled the country's railroads, its only major Atlantic port, its electrical grid, and its telephone system. It also installed and removed regimes at will, while the peasants, that is most of the people, were generally treated as beasts of burden. Sullivan and Cromwell, the Dulles Brothers American law firm, represented United Fruit, as well as several other American companies in Guatemala. Foster and Allen had both worked as American as United Fruits lawyers, Helpless. and Allen had served on the company's board of directors. In fact, it was Foster who wrote the one-sided 1930s agreement cementing United Fruits hegemony in Guatemala, including a 99-year lease over one-seventh of the country's arable land. Both brothers had held substantial blocks of United Fruit stock and thereby derived a steady income from the company. <coughs> Uh, many other American officials had lucrative financial ties with the corporate behemoth, especially within the Eisenhower administration. In fact, United Fruit was a major force throughout Washington. In 1944, a progressive government came to power in Guatemala, deposing the dictator General Jorge Ubico. It then instituted major economic reforms, such as a minimum wage and a 48-hour work week. Jacobo Arbenz helped organize this revolution and then became Guatemala's president in 1951. Arbenz and his wife Maria have been described as the Kennedys of Guatemala's fledgling, fledgling democracy. Young, rich, good-looking, and dedicated to improving the lives of their people. Arbenz's objectives for his country were purely aimed at a healthy economic development. In fact, he stated that he wanted to make Guatemala, quote, a modern capitalist state, and welcomed, welcomed foreign capital as long as it remains always subordinate to Guatemalan laws and strictly abstains from intervening in the nation's social and political life. Notice how weird these guys are with these ideas, right? <clears throat> in June 1952, Arbenz pushed through his government a sweeping land reform bill, the first serious land reform law in Central American history, intended to correct the country's extremely inequitable distribution of farmland. Large landowners, naturally including United Fruit, were required to sell uncultivated holdings to the government subsequently to be allotted to peasant fa families. The expropriations were fairly compensated, but United Fruit took this law as a mortal affront and a declaration of war. Eisenhower and the Dulles brothers proceeded to paint Arbenz as a, crim uh, as a Kremlin puppet and Guatemala as a Soviet beachhead in the Western Hemisphere. Foster accused uh, the Arbenz government of imposing, quote, a communist-type reign of terror on the Guatemalan people. So when you give uh, people land, uh, that's obviously terrorism, right? In fact, Arbenz was merely a progressive nationalist. There were only four communists in Guatemala's 56-member Congress and no communist ministers in Arbenz's administration. Historian Jim Handy described Arbenz's economic and political ideals as decidedly pragmatic and capitalist in temper. Yet Foster Dulles proclaimed, utterly without foundation, that Latin America was under attack by the apparatus of international communism acting under orders from Moscow. 
In fact, there was no Soviet presence in Guatemala at all in 1954, not even a consulate. To restore the freedom that Guatemala had supposedly, supposedly lost under a bend, the CIA naturally, yes, engineered a coup. <clears throat> it bombed um, high profile, the CIA that is, bombed high profile targets in Guatemala City, subverted the Guatemalan military with large bribes, and drew up a hit list of at least 58 Guatemalan leaders to be liquidated. Our men soon surrendered and fled, and the public army, and the puppet, Army Colonel Castillo Armas, was installed in his place. That's the guy next to the driver there. Armas then dissolved Congress, suspended the Constitution, and of course repealed the land reform law. Guatemala went on to suffer a long future of US-backed bloody dictatorship, death squads, and killing fields. 250,000 people were killed in the next four decades. <coughs> OK, well, on to more killing. There's the Congo. Where's the US in that picture? OK, no, no more comments on that. Um, the saga of the Congo is probably the most perfect story of rapacious Western imperialism that one can imagine. The U.S. would finally get involved decades later, but we have to go back a ways to understand the Congo's modern history. In 1897, a British shipping clerk named E.D. Morel was working in Antwerp, Belgium, for a company that transported cargo between Belgium and the Congo Free State. He noticed that while the ships would come in loaded with valuable cargoes of rubber and ivory, they would steam back out to the Congo carrying only army officers, firearms, and ammunition. As Adam Hochschild describes it, <clears throat> there is no trade going on here. As Morel watches these riches steam into Europe with almost no goods being sent to Africa to pay for them, he realizes that there can, only be, there can be only one explanation for their source, slave labor. What Morel found, uh, found out was something hitherto practically unknown to the outside world that the Congo was one vast slave labor camp, an entire state deliberately predicated on the genocidal exploitation of the native population's labor power. The profits thus acquired supplied Belgium the financial capital to build many of its public works, monuments, palaces, museums, parks, and accounted for a significant part of the country's economic growth and development. In 1885, during Europe's mad scramble for Africa, King Leopold of Belgium acquired for himself the Congo, 80 times, a country 80 times the size of Belgium, the size of all of Western Europe. So there's um, uh, the Congo overlaid on Europe. There's um, Belgium, right? That little country rules this land in the middle of Africa. <clears throat> all right, so. Um, Leopold called this land that he claimed the Congo Free State. <laughs> All right? To make people slaves, obviously, you have to call it a free state. It was the world's only colony claimed by one man alone. Leopold owned the Congo with all its people just as John D. Rockefeller owned Standard Oil. One of the most intriguing aspects of the whole Sari Congo story is the method Leopold used to finally win possession of his great prize. Leopold recognized that to attain it, and he did so more through international wheeling and dealing than military conquest, he would have to portray his country-grabbing campaign as a purely altruistic humanitarian venture. He therefore talked about curbing the slave trade. He's going to go and make this a slave trade. He's talking about curbing the slave trade. There was, there was Arab slave trade in Central Africa, okay, but it wasn't on you know, that big a scale. <clears throat> he also talked about moral uplift the advancement of science and economic development, not profits. Leopold was thus what one historian called a master illusionist. And in fact, he was much admired throughout Europe as a philanthropic monarch doing good works in Africa. And just a little side note, Leopold was not the only or the last Western ruler or government to utilize such deception in their, imperial, in, uh, their imperialist quests. The economy of the Congo, such as it was, amounted to little more than forcing the inhabitants to go into the forest and bring back immense quantities of ivory ripped from the bodies of slaughtered elephants and rubber tapped from trees or vines. 
uh, they were made to bring these uh, to the depots of the colonial companies <coughs> on pain of death. The violent methods used included hostage taking. <coughs> to force men to do the assigned work, soldiers would keep their families hostage in dirt compounds, often in chains and with little or nothing to eat. Thousands of women, children, and elderly people died of starvation and disease from this treatment. Cold-blooded mass murder. The inhabitants of villages, unwilling or unable to fulfill the regime's quotas, were often shot in mass, that is, massacred, to send other villages a message. Resistance of any kind was fatal. Mass terror and wanton destruction. Soldiers routinely stole villagers' food and animals and also burned their huts and crops or even their entire villages. Hundreds of thousands of people were thus forced to flee into the forest and swamp with no shelter and little food. Entire districts were depopulated. Widespread torture and bodily, bodily mutilation. Notoriously, hands were severed and heads collected. As Adam Hofdahl says, the territory was a, uh, was a wash in corpses, sometimes literally. Has anybody heard about um, this Congo slave trade and the hand business? Has anybody heard about the Congo slave trade uh, and, and, and the hands, the issue of people's hands being cut off? One, one or two? Okay. Those are people's hands that those guys are holding. Okay. That man is uh, watching, uh, looking at his daughter's uh, severed hand and foot. These images were made this, this uh, issue an international cause at the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries. So about these hands. <clears throat> the colonial officials enforced the labor compulsion through literally mass murderous violence. The police were therefore made to kill large numbers of people to demonstrate that they were utilizing, the, uh, utilizing their proper amount of force. They were required to produce a hand of the dead victim to prove that they had killed them. The practice was so widespread that hands were collected in baskets and became a kind of currency. But since it was hands and not bodies that, the, that had to be brought to the authorities, the police get, could get away with cutting the victim's hands off without killing them. That's why you have children and survivors without hands. The famous novel, Heart of Darkness, by Joseph Conrad, is actually based on the author's stay in the Congo, which he depicted as a veritable chamber of horrors. Has anybody, uh, I, I myself haven't read that book. Has anybody read Heart of Darkness? Yeah. What yeah, do you guys well, think? Well, it's a, the movie, a popular movie, a apocalypse now, it's so with the so Heart of Darkness. So much, yeah. Not, not, not literally, but anyway, okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so at one point, the protagonist, Marlowe, looks through binoculars at what he thinks are ornamental knobs atop the fence posts in front of Kurtz's house, Kurtz was doing, and discovers that they're Africans' heads. The final death toll in Leopold's Congo was of genocidal proportions. The population was cut in half by 10 million. In 1908, due to pressure from various sides, the Congo Free State was taken from Leopold and annexed by the Belgian government to become the Belgian Congo. But although the methods of exploitation were now somewhat less brutal, there was no radical change in the deplorable uh, conditions of the population, since, it through, since the root cause, complete, ruthless foreign domination, remained. Thus, severe underdevelopment and lack of freedom plagued the Congo throughout the entire first half of the 20th century. Finally, an independence movement arose in the late 1950s, which was eventually led by the magnetic Patrice Lumumba. <coughs> He became, wait, wait, wait. This is Patrice Lumumba? Yeah. He became... Yeah. Listen, can I have... Very, I, I don't need to interrupt, but can I do something? I'm from Soviet Union, right? And it's in Moscow, big university. Uh, the the Patrice, I never saw his picture before. Yeah. And we're from Russia, like, long time ago. First time I see you. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Wow. So, um, he became the Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1960. While the Lumbas proclaimed that Africa must cease to be an economic colony of Europe, serious, not merely nominal independence of this sort would threaten the common financial interests of Belgian, British, American, and French multinational corporations, which now, having moved on from ivory and rubber, consisted largely of the country's vast mineral wealth, including uranium, gold, and diamonds. The imperial powers therefore decided that as, a, as the influential embodiment of an asserted African nationalism, Lumumba had to be stopped. 
After uh, Al, excuse me, Alan Dulles predictably characterized Lumumba, Lumumba as a communist tool. In reality, Lumumba had little connection to Moscow. He, in fact, vowed that the Congo would, quote, never be a satellite of Russia or of the United States. We want no part of the Cold War. We want Africa to remain African with a policy of neutralism. <clears throat> Simply put, Lumumba was not a communist. A CIA officer described him as, first and foremost, an African nationalist. Less than two months after Lumumba was named the duly elected prime minister of the country, this new nation finally er emerging from a long hellish enslavement, President Eisenhower ordered his assassination. The CIA considered various means by which to eliminate Lumumba, but now that he was under heavily guarded house arrest, um, it's, uh, the operatives, the CIA operatives, couldn't get close enough to him to do the job. Instead, the agency ended up supporting the efforts of the Belgians and Lumumba's Congolese political enemies. Lumumba was killed on January 17, 1961, just as John F. Kennedy was taking office after winning the 1960 presidential election. Having supported the cause of, national, of African nationalism, Kennedy was genuinely dismayed by this turn of events. In the decades that followed, the Congo experienced a further nightmare of, of unrivaled corruption, poverty, dysfunction, and violence under the, the depraved dictatorship of Mobutu Sese Seko. The country's wealth was once again being siphoned into the pockets of the despot and the coffers of multinational corporations. Such was the product of the U.S.'s fight against quote-unquote communism. Here in the Congo, as in the Iran and Guatemala, American overseas aggression, in fact, had nothing whatsoever to do with communism. This is Mabutu. And everything, yes, and everything to do with the utterly immoral imperatives of American capital. <coughs> okay, moving on to Vietnam, and you'll notice, and I say these things because you kind of have to state the obvious sometimes. Um, Otherwise, people don't see what's blindingly clear. There's Vietnam over there, right? On the right side of that map. The US is on the other side of the world. Uh, do countries over here worry about what's happening in Vietnam? Do countries over here worry about what's happening in Vietnam? No. The US is always worrying about what's happening all over the goddamn world, right? <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so the Vietnamese have always been a fiercely independent people. The country was a self-governing state for most of the time from the 13th century when it repelled the invading armies of the Mongol Empire, Emperor Kublai Khan. Okay, from the 13th century <coughs> until it succumbed to the superior forces of French colonialists in the late 1800s. The French proceeded ruthlessly to exploit the Vietnamese people and extract the country's resources for their own benefit, dispossessing the Vietnamese peasants of their land and further enriching the large native landowners in the process. An anti-colonial movement soon developed from the beginning led by the communists, with majority support in the countryside. Ho Chi Minh, the struggle of name leader, was not a doctrinaire communist. He was a pragmatist who believed from a very young age that national liberation was the most important problem facing the people. His attraction to Marxism in the early 1920s lay mainly in its anti-imperialist message, promising to all colonial peoples liberation from European rule. He explained years afterward that he was and this is his words, it was patriotism and not communism that originally inspired him. In sum, Ho Chi Minh was first and foremost a Vietnamese nationalist. Just as Ho Chi Minh was not simply or primarily a, a, a communist, the Viet Minh was not simply or primarily a communist organization, but rather a nationalist front, a broad, inclusive coalition against foreign occupation, uniting workers, capitalists, Peasants, anyone and everyone committed to the anti-imperial independence struggle. When World War II suddenly, oops, let's see where I'm not there yet. <coughs> when World War II suddenly ended in 1945, there was a power vacuum in Vietnam. The Viet Minh, being by far the strongest and most popular political <coughs> entity in the country, declared Vietnam independent, took control, and established the Democratic Republic of Vietnam a fully sovereign country. The Viet Minh's policies, sorry, getting off track here. 
of the Vietnamese policies once they took power were not those of rapid communists. Um, Ho's government carried out a reformist rather than a revolutionary program, abolishing owners' taxes but leaving landowners unmolested and instructing local governments to make room for middle classes. Ho repeatedly appealed to the United States for recognition, um, recognition and support, but the U.S. had no interest whatsoever in self-rule for Vietnam, and it utterly ignored Ho's entreaties. Vastly more important to the U.S. were good relations with staunch allies, France and Britain, who of course possessed full-on empires of the traditional uh, territorial kind. Thus, with American blessing, and later with American military aid, the French reasserted their authority in Vietnam after World War II, forcing the Viet Minh to resort to armed struggle, a struggle which they won at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. <coughs> So uh, where was the evil empire all this time? In general, the USSR displayed little interest in the Viet Minh cause during the early years of the Vietnam conflict. In fact, at the Geneva Conference, the, Soviet, the Soviets fully supported and, pro and, and proposed, excuse me, fully supported the proposed partition of the country, with both the Soviets and the Chinese pressuring the Viet Minh into accepting this horrendous deal which negated much of their hard-won battlefield victory. The Soviets in particular were constantly wishing for peaceful coexistence and improved relations with the U.S. and the West. This was the priority for them. Being dragged into a thorny conflict with the Americans was, was the last thing in the world they wanted. <coughs> in sum, the notion that the Soviet Union was the driving force behind the Vietnamese communists, or that it was attempting the takeover of any Southeast Asian country, was not seriously entertained, entertained by any knowledgeable observer at the time. The State Department's own specialists reported that, quote, the Vietnamese communists are not subservient to Kremlin directives. So why did the U.S. enter the conflict in Indochina, even after France had lost there? The answer is that uh, because a strong, independent national government in the third world, especially those, aimed to, uh, to, uh, those that aim to rectify economic inequities in their societies, irrespective of Western desires, were an impediment to the, to the Americans' globalist agenda and thus considered the enemy. This was the reality behind the new Pax Americana. Less readily apparent, but probably just as significant, was the government's desire to counter the union and civil rights movements arising in the U.S. itself in the post-war era, which reactionary elites absurdly characterized as communist. If you can conjure up a communist enemy overseas, you can then use the specter of this putative evil to battle against what you speciously call communism at home. But to be most effective, this duplicitous strategy required finding and actually fighting communists somewhere or other, even if in reality they bore not the slightest ill will toward Americans. And so you find communists somewhere or other and say, okay, I find communists, then you call your uh, domestic enemies communists, and you say, okay, this is all part of the same struggle. <clears throat> Holy struggle. The new government of South Vietnam, the RBN, the Republic of Vietnam, created in 1955, was led by a land-favoring Catholic Mandarin returned from exile named uh, N Ngo Dinh Diem. It thus had little in the way of a grassroots base in the predominantly Buddhist country. Did everybody, anybody know Diem was a Catholic in the Buddhist country? Did anybody know that? Okay, anyway. <clears throat> The RBN was therefore from the beginning completely dependent on American aid, a mere facade of a state having no semblance of democracy and thus embodying no democracy for anyone to defend. Indeed, Diem's government was little more than a narrow oligarchy consisting mostly of relatives serving as an instrument of the U.S. But the U.S. soon encountered a huge problem. As corrupt as they certainly were, the South Vietnamese leaders were neither particularly concerned about communism nor are much interested in fighting their supposed enemies. The American military leaders fear that Diem and his brother Nu were about to make a deal with Hanoi and abandon the war effort altogether was actually what led them to encourage and approve the November 1963 coup, resulting in the brothers' notorious assassination. <coughs> now this was, this was no chance thing. Several more American-sponsored coups followed in quick succession. One author counts seven. 
and all for the same reason. Finally, the U.S. found suitably compliant puppets to do their bidding. Nguyen Van, Van Thieu and Nguyen Kao Ki. But whatever the South Vietnamese people's nominal leaders <laughs> agreed to, as the conflict continued interminably, it became ever more clear that the people themselves, including the ARVN, the Army of South Vietnam, were simply not committed to the struggle against their communist brothers and sisters. It became apparent as early as 1964 that the American government and its military leaders were, were more committed to the war than were the people they were supposed to be liberating. One South Vietnamese official actually stated, our big advantage over the Americans is that they want to win the war more than we do. Okay. Thus, there can be no question whatsoever that among all the parties involved in Vietnam, it was the U.S. that was the fanatical aggressor in the conflict. So much so, that rather than abandon the badly, uh, the badly flagging enterprise, it doubled down and transformed, to, transformed it into a large-scale war in 1965 with the Marines sent in in large numbers for the first time. It was thus LBJ, not, uh, yeah, it was thus LBJ, not JFK, who seriously escalated the Vietnam War. Despite uh, the straightforward imperial logic of domination described above, it has been argued by some observers, such as Fletcher Prouty, that the armed conflicts that the U.S. has been involved in since the end of World War II, including Vietnam, have actually been waged not for geopolitical reasons at all, legitimate or otherwise, but rather for the immense profits to be gained by military contractors and bankers. In this view, the Vietnam, as well as the Korean conflict, were artificial make-war operations. We're Andy, and you said something about this, right? War in Iraq, yeah. Yeah, and you said something about your personal experience in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> in this, okay, so this would explain why it often seemed, and still does to some, that simply keeping the war going, not winning it, was the prime objective. Prouty states bluntly that <coughs> manufacturing and selling armaments is what perpetual warfare is all about. One of the fundamental purposes of the Cold War was to, uh, has been to escalate arms production and sales on a global basis. Whatever the Americans, let me see, maybe war has been Whatever the Americans' precise purposes were in instigating the Vietnam War, in the end, millions of Vietnamese, Laotians, and Cambodians were killed. The slaughter was so profligate and indiscriminate that one Vietnam War author could title his book after the implicit order given to American soldiers, Kill Anything That Moves. That's the title of this guy's book, and I read that book. Has anybody else read that book? It's an excellent book. All in a struggle that would never have happened and should never have happened at all but for U.S. imperial aggression. Okay, finally getting to Kennedy. <coughs> JFK um, eventually saw that the so-called so -called Cold War was an essentially fraudulent scheme driven by an out-of-control deep state. He planned to rectify this situation. The establishment therefore killed him. The Kennedys were rich, but they were never in the very top stratum of American wealth. They had risen from immigrant saloon keepers through urban machine politics. They were not old money, and of course they were not wasps. JFK himself had little personal acquaintance with members of the New York establishment. David Talbot states that he was never fully accepted within this inner sanctum of power. As a young, up-and-coming politician, JFK did make use of some Cold War language. But this was, for the most part, merely the unavoidable lingua franca of American politics at the time. He was never a died in the Cold War Cold warrior. In, in particular, his vociferous criticisms of Western colonialism from early on in his career, including, for instance, his call for Algerian independence, were frowned upon <coughs> in globalist corporate circles. These early indications of an imperial, anti-imperial mindset would become marked tendencies after he became president. Now, the American presidency is potentially a very powerful office. While it's almost always occupied by a, a well-controlled stooge, and therefore does fine service to the oligarchy as a public relations facade, if and when an independent-minded person enters the office, he or she can seriously start to derail the elite's agenda. The presidency is thus, from the oligarchy's perspective, the weak link in the U.S. constitutional machinery. Congress is always subservient. 
precisely because it's a large body of many individuals. The vast majority have always been and will always be tools of their elite patrons. Any true independence, for instance, uh, Dennis Kucinich, <clears throat> are rendered impotent from sheer lack of numbers. The, the Supreme Court is also a collective body, and worse still, it's not even a proactive formulator of policy. That leaves the president as the wild card, the sole possible challenger to the power of the economic elite in the governmental structure. John Kennedy was keenly aware of the highest office's potential, and he fully intended to make use of it. He was not to be, he was not about to be a president who, as he puts it, as he, as he put it rather, uh, confined himself to ceremonial functions. Kennedy also strongly subscribed to the conviction that the president represents, in fact, not just in words or on paper, the masses of the people. That he is there to serve their interests, not those of any well-moneyed cabal. While campaigning for, for the office, Kennedy stated, the responsibility of the president is especially great. He must serve as a catalyst, an energizer, the defender of the public good and the public interest against all the narrow private interests which operate in our society. Only the president can do this. And I believe that the president should use whatever power is necessary to do the job. <coughs> One of the most important but least widely known episodes in Kennedy's presidency was his confrontation with U.S. Steel. Has anybody heard about this U.S. Steel confrontation? Has anyone? One person? Two, three? Okay. In 1962, in an effort to control inflation, Kennedy concluded an informal agreement with the leaders of the steel industry. This included wage concessions from the steel workers union. Immediately afterward, however, U.S. Steel completely sabotaged the spirit of the negotiations by announcing that it was raising the price of steel, a key industrial commodity, with several other giant steel corporations following suit. Kennedy was furious at this double cross, what he called this defiance of the public interest. The American people, he said, will find it hard, as I do, to accept a situation in which a tiny handful of, ex of steel executives, whose pursuit of private power and profit exceeds their sense of public responsibility, can show utter contempt for the interests of 185 Americans. Given uh, the interlocking board of directors of the country's largest corporations, led by Morgan and Rockefeller, Roger Blau, the chairman of U.S. Steel, was not in this showdown representing just one corporation, but rather the nation's industrial giants collectively. Kennedy, the steel industry, and the establishment thus all saw this crisis for what it was at bottom, a contest of wills between the young president and corporate America over who would run the nation. Kennedy responded to the steel industry's challenge with unprecedented vigor and determination over the next three days. He ordered the, defense, the uh, Department of Defense, a humongous steel customer, to, to buy the product only from those steel companies that, he, that had not raised their prices. And he had Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, his brother of course, initiate an antitrust investigation of the steel company's collusion. Bobby Kennedy threatened not just the companies with fines, but also their executives with jail time. Has anybody heard anything like that happening lately? Maybe Reagan, I think, uh, actually did do some of that, but generally speaking, um, you know, that doesn't happen. The result of this astonishingly sharp pressure <coughs> was uh, that within a few days, U.S. Steel and the others rescinded their prices. <coughs> the steel industry rebellion had been crushed, and the American corporate world put on notice that this president was not pussyfooting around. Conversely, having committed unforgivable sins in this encounter, John and Robert Kennedy would henceforth be viewed by the financial barons as Wall Street's mortal enemies. <coughs> Many of Kennedy's uh, genuinely progressive economic policies attacked the elite's special privileges, and I'll mention just a few uh, here. Kennedy infuriated uh, the Western oil moguls by planning to do away with the cherished oil depletion allowance, a tax loophole with millions or even billions of dollars a year to them. And these people, by the way, were connected to LBJ, who was a, a thorough scoundrel, but I won't get into that. <clears throat> Kennedy's various tax reform measures uh, curtailed the traditional selfish practices of large corporations and investors, including their penchant for channeling money and credit into speculative, non-productive, often foreign investments, as well as hiding their wealth in overseas tax shelters. 
In general, Kennedy sought to tax the super rich more effectively. He was not at all anti-capitalist per se. Rather, he sought to fashion policies such that the nation's economic activity would benefit everyone equitably, thus leading to rising wages and standards of living for everyone, rather than the rich and the enrichment of only a few. Now, this graph here shows the rise in productivity, that blue line, since 1950. And as you, as you see, it goes straight up, constantly, right? Hourly compensation, workers' wages, flatline, um, right around uh, 1970. <clears throat> this is the same graph, just different scale. Uh, it says, you're working harder, but your wages aren't going up. This is what Kennedy was trying to prevent. Kennedy also attempted to increase the supply of money and low interest credit by injecting them directly into the economy, by passing the immensely lucrative, the immensely lucrative private control of the nation's money supply by the Morgan and Rockefeller, again, uh, connected Federal Reserve. To this effect, Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110 on June 4, 1963, authorizing the Treasury Department to start printing and issuing silver certificates. United States notes based on its own reserves. Not surprisingly, Kennedy encountered profound hostility, one author calls it deep animal animosity, to his policies in corporate circles, whose wanted the freedom was and is their freedom to have it their way in the economy and in society. They took grave umbrage at this upstart president, serious, seriously and systematically <clears throat> taking concrete steps to rein in unfettered capitalism and thereby curb their customary financial power, far beyond what any other president had done. The depth of the growing enmity between Kennedy and the corporate elite is reflected in JFK's famous outburst in the wake of the steel crisis. My father always told me that all businessmen were sons of bitches, but I never believed it until now. <coughs> James Douglas says of this offhand but widely publicized comment, the corporate world never forgot it. More so than uh, most other major politicians, Kennedy often made reference to the horrors of war, especially in the nuclear age. Conversely, he spoke often and passionately of his desire for peace. As early as 1946, a young John F. Kennedy stated, we now have a world capable of destroying itself. The days which lie ahead are most <coughs> difficult ones. Above all, day and night, with every ounce of ingenuity and industry we possess, we must work for peace. We must not have another war. In particular, Kennedy saw the relationship between the U.S. and the Soviet Union as a friendly, competitive coexistence, not as a belligerent, potentially deadly turf rivalry. He saw, as he put it to the U.N. on September 20, 1963, a new approach to the Cold War, a desire not to bury one's adversary, but to compete in a host of peaceful arenas, in ideas, in production, and ultimately in service to all mankind. And in the contest for a better life, all the world can be a winner. Kennedy backed up his words with executive actions. He ordered the closing of numerous domestic military installations and overseas bases. In August 1963, he pushed through the passage of an atmospheric nuclear test ban treaty and installed a hotline, a hotline, yeah, a hotline telephone system between Washington and Moscow. Kennedy proposed reducing or eliminating many weapon systems and he aimed at a general and complete disarmament. His NSAM 239, that's National Security Action Memorandum, called for just this. <coughs> Excuse me. Kennedy's peace agenda, of course, jeopardized trillions of dollars in profits for the weapons industries. One more strike against him on the establishment's scorekeeping card. While most presidents don't even admit that American imperialism exists, even as they actively pursue it, Kennedy not only acknowledged it, but rejected it. As he stated in one of his most famous speeches, he was explicitly against, quote, a Pax Americana enforced on the world by, by American weapons of war. Okay, contrast that. Um, with what the, that, those CFR guys, Council on Foreign Relations guys, said that I quoted earlier. Compare that with what uh, the Project for a New American Century, the Bush-Cheney uh, cabal said later. They literally 
in, in, in that term called for a Pax Americana. In 1961, Kennedy stated, we must face the fact that the United States is neither omnipotent nor omniscient, that we cannot impose our will upon the other 94% of mankind, and that, there, and that uh, therefore there cannot be an American solution to every problem, every world problem that is. <coughs> Compare that statement with uh, what many modern politicians uh, say. For instance, Madeleine Albright, remember her uh, infamous comment about the, well, actually not infamous, but the comment about the indispensable nation, she called the U.S. the indispensable nation that had to use force around the world. On November 18, 1963, just days before his death, Kennedy affirmed that the U.S. would, quote, not dictate to any nation how to organize its economic life. Every nation is free to shape its own institutions in accordance with its own national needs and will. Kennedy respected third world mutualism, or non-alignment, which was anathema to the establishment. Again, Kennedy backed up his sentiments with policy. He, of course, rejected an all-out invasion of Cuba, as we'll see in a moment. He refused to introduce ground forces into Laos. He refused to escalate involvement in Vietnam into full-scale war, as we saw and he backed a hands-off approach in the Congo. Kennedy supported the nationalization of mines and the formation of state oil companies in Latin America. Such postures on foreign affairs especially offended the Rockefeller brothers, Nelson and David, both of whom were militant upholders of U.S. imperial interests, particularly in Latin America, where they had extensive holdings. Throughout his presidency, Kennedy was subjected to immense pressure from his own military establishment to topple Cuba's communist government. Although Kennedy put on a show of besieging Cuba with relatively minor measures, he steadfastly resisted the persistent calls of his military leaders for more devastating action. After the Eisenhower initiated CIA orchestrated Bay of fiasco, Kennedy vowed never again to be overawed by the military. It was around this time that a furious Kennedy threatened to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind. <clears throat> um, as I'm sure some of you have heard of that comment. Okay. During this period, uh, General Curtis LeMay, among others, fully expected a nuclear war to occur at any moment. He called it inevitable. These were men who believed that the U.S. could claim victory in a nuclear war even if it lost 20 or 30 million people. At one national security meeting, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Lyman Lemnitzer and CIA Director Alan Dulles presented Kennedy with an official plan for a surprise nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. Yeah, who is this? That's um, Curtis, Curtis Lemay. Lemay, General Curtis Lemay. A disgusted uh, Kennedy got up and walked out in the middle of this meeting, remarking afterward, and we call ourselves the human race. On another occasion, he observed simply, these people are crazy. <laughs> to sane people, both at the time and since, the Cuban Missile Crisis was an unimaginable catastrophe narrowly averted. But, the, but to the military and intelligence leaders in JFK's government, it was a badly missed golden opportunity to deal a final blow to Castro's Cuba. Kennedy's refusal to play along and his determination to resolve the crisis peacefully instead infuriated the Cold Warriors to no end, to the point that, as a young Daniel Ellsberg observed at the time, there was virtually, virtually a coup atmosphere in Pentagon circles. It was a mood of hatred and rage. The atmosphere was poisonous. poisonous. Worse still, from the Cold Warriors' point of view, Kennedy was not only tacitly acting in concert with the communist enemy, he was engaging him in actual friendly dialogue, even in uh, an exchange of heartfelt personal letters. And you should read some of the, I haven't read all the letters, but some of the things these guys say to each other, uh, they, were, uh, they were really, you know, connected. Kennedy and Khrushchev, in fact, developed a respectful relationship, virtually an alliance against their respective military establishments leading the militarists to conclude that Kennedy had become an outright traitor. Thus, among the many motives for the assassination of the president, none could have been more urgent than the oligarchy's dire need to disrupt the developing detente between Washington and Moscow, which threatened the entire foundation of the Cold War regime. At 
As with his refusal to invade Cuba, Kennedy in the fall of 1961 rejected the virtually unanimous recommendation of his advisors to send combat troops into Vietnam. <coughs> uh, not only that, by 1962, Kennedy was instructing his generals to draw up a plan for withdrawal. James Douglas says, his military chiefs were shocked for the United States to withdraw from Vietnam was unthinkable. On November 20, 1963, just days before his assassination, Kennedy, Kennedy drew up NSAM 263, which ordered the withdrawal of 1,000 U.S. troops from Vietnam, the rest to follow up by the end of 1965. Kennedy had once said, this war in Vietnam, it's never off my mind. It haunts me day and night. The first thing I do when I'm reelected, I'm going to get the Americans out of Vietnam. That is my number one priority. Get out of Southeast Asia. We are not going to have men ground up in this fashion, this far away from home. I'm going to get those guys out. And he said this kind of thing numerous times. The contrast between Kennedy's and Johnson's electoral strategies with regard to Vietnam is dramatic. Kennedy was waiting for a second election win to give him a clear popular mandate so he could pursue peace without hindrance. A year later, LBJ waited for his own election win so he could pursue war, infamously telling the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just get me elected and you can have your war. <clears throat> as many uh, historical observers, can, that's LBJ there, as many historical observers can see only too well, the CIA by Kennedy's time had become a god unto itself an autonomous fourth branch of government not accountable to the other branches, nor to any other entity on Earth. As with his Vietnam withdrawal plan, Kennedy was also biding his time with regard to fully effective action concerning the CIA. He explicitly reiterated his earlier vow. When I am re-elected in 1964, uh, he, said, okay, he said, when I am re-elected, um, and I'm saying in 1964, I am going to break that agency into a thousand pieces. Kennedy further intended to remove the petty tyrant J. Edgar Hoover from the FBI's directorship, thereby cutting that agency down to size as well. The establishment undoubtedly knew of Kennedy's plans to emasculate its state police instruments, giving it one more reason to act promptly and kill him before the next election. Excuse me. Who, who is that? That's J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover. None other. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Who is this? J. Edgar Hooper, the director of the FBI. Okay, so I have a, a quite a lot more material on, on the assassination uh, assassination itself, not not the uh, guns and bullets type. Uh, so I'll just skim through this. I'm not going to read it because I I don't, I don't have time. So these guys, uh, law enforcement agents like um, Katzen, uh, Nicholas Katzenbach, I think was his name, yeah. um, and others were, were from the beginning saying Oswald did it. And we have to say that Os Oswald did it. Okay, just within a couple of days, all right, um, they were saying, we don't, this isn't, we don't have to investigate this. We, uh, this is what we're going to say. They actually literally used the term, we have to lay the dust, settle the dust. Those were their terms. Uh, on, on this on this thing, we can't we can't really seriously investigate. It. <clears throat> um, now, Jess Curry, or Jess Curry, uh, however you say it, he was the police captain in Dallas at the time. He didn't say uh, Oswald did it, and he had no accomplices. Okay, because there, he was he and others are responsible police agencies. They aren't trying to cover anything up. Um, a couple of newspapers on um, on the day after, and also a couple of days later. Uh, we're uh, throwing out this, this meme of, well, you know, uh, in American history, we always have assassinations and they're always by lone nuts. Nothing to see here, just some crazy, okay? Those, those are the headlines there. <laughs> history of assassination, shame of the nation. Lone assassin, the rule in U.S., plotting more prevalent abroad. So those people over there, they kill uh, their leaders for political reasons. Uh, we don't do that kind of thing. <clears throat> we just have a couple nuts running around. So, People like this guy, Eugene Rostow, <clears throat> were steady uh, uh, trying to get up, uh, get this uh, uh, Warren Commission going. Okay, a commission rather than a congressional investigation. A, a congressional investigation 
you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it, uh, at least it gets information out and, and it does some real digging, right? But a, a commission uh, is a different story altogether. As we know from the 9-11 commission, the uh, Kennedy Assassin uh, Assassination Commission uh, was led by uh, War Alan Dulles, who probably was the mastermind of the whole current assassination. Okay. And this guy here, John McCloy, who was the, he was called the, um, the chairman of the establishment, his, his, his biographer, he called the chairman of the establishment. These guys are political operatives, these two right here. Okay. The other guys are pretty much, uh, well this guy was involved too. He was the friend of the CIA and the FBI, Gerald Ford. The others were just hanging around. They probably weren't doing all that much. They were full-time, they had full-time jobs. Alan Dulles at this time didn't even have a full-time job. Uh, he had been fired by Kennedy. He could spend all his time plotting to kill Kennedy and also then cover it up. There's our friend Alan Dulles, uh, John McCoy. Those, those guys were key, absolutely key. Okay? So when you have a commission, you can staff it, you can put on it um, people, operatives, who are going to you know, take care of business. That's what happened. Uh, now, some people, um, now with the, as to the Warren Commission's actual proceedings, some people were giving absolutely key testimony. Uh, like this guy, uh, I believe his name is uh, Weitzman, or Seymour, yeah, Seymour Weitzman. Uh, he uh, ran up to the top of the uh, grassy knoll, jumped over the fence, and found a, a railroad employee standing there. And the railroad the employee told him, I, saw, uh, uh, I heard a noise and saw somebody throw something into a bush as the president is uh, limousine passed by. The Warren Commission uh, had this guy, interviewed him, and as soon as he said what, what I just described, just a couple sentences, they said, okay, we've had enough, that, that's enough, bye. They dismissed it. <laughs> Throughout the rest of the Warren Commission, you never heard another word about, uh, about that testimony. This is the kind of thing that the Warren Commission, uh, and I, obviously I don't have time to go into a whole lot of detail, but this is the kind of thing that the Warren Commission did systematically. It did not interview key, absolutely key witnesses. Uh, guys, people that were standing right there, feet away, literally a few feet away from the president and saw where the bullet came from or how, how uh, the president's head blew you know, in one direction and they're saying another direction and they didn't even, they didn't even call those people, okay? And then when they, when they did call them, they were dismissed or pressured and just all kinds of um, uh, uh, terrible practices. Um, now, you all know, probably at least heard about the stretcher where the, uh, silver, the magic bullet was probably found. Everybody knows that, right? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Um, or many people know that. Anyway. So, uh, the, mat, the quote unquote magic bullet that went through Connolly, okay, and did some somersaults, and then went through, excuse me, went through Kennedy first, killed him, and then did a detour <laughs> somehow or other, and then went through Connolly, and then supposedly came out of Connolly, Connolly's body, was not found inside Connolly. Okay, did, did you guys know that? It was found on a stretcher sitting there, okay, and this stretcher, along with another one like this, had been sitting there for hours. Alright, and then finally somebody, some, some CIA operative, said, oh wait a minute, I found, I found a bullet. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so there was no connection, no ver uh, verifiable connection at all between this magic bullet uh, and the assassination. But that was the key piece of evidence in, in, in the whole um, story. So many people have called the Warren Commission report, uh, in so many words, pure, uh, pure nonsense. Okay. Um, let me try to show and uh, at least one quote. Mark Lane. <clears throat> Mark Lane um, is one of the best authors <laughs> on the assassination. Uh, he called it. Uh, he said the commission's report was an intelligence fabrication. Period. So um, let me uh, read a little bit here. In sum, the nature of the Warren Commission report is by itself, quite apart from the many other dubious aspects of the official story of the Kennedy assassination, damning evidence of a cover-up, and thus of an assassination having been a false flag operation concocted at the highest levels. Now, um, uh, a lot of people were killed, okay? A lot of key witnesses. Um, this guy was on a, uh, in, a, in a railroad tower looking down on the assassins, okay? Uh, he was killed. This man, um, uh, uh, Commander uh, Pitzer, he was the person who took pictures of the autopsy and, ha and had film of the autopsy. They would have shown exactly what happened to Kennedy's body. He was killed, and the film was never found. Uh, this guy saw Oswald running uh, down to a car, and he described the whole thing. 
whereas the official story has Oswald going on, on some crazy uh, trip through town and killing an, uh, this officer, uh, Tim. That was uh, complete nonsense. And uh, many others, plus several other people, uh, corroborated what this guy said, Roger Craig. Mary Meyer was a lover of uh, JFK. She was uh, killed. Uh, she said, she said um, something very incriminating, but uh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, she said, they couldn't control him anymore. He was changing too fast. They've covered everything up. I gotta come see you. I'm afraid. This is what he she told her friend um, on the phone. She was killed right afterward. Mary Kilgallen, she, was, uh, she interviewed uh, Ruby, Jack Ruby, who was gonna spill the beans anyway. Um, she got the story. She said she was about to quote unquote break the real story. Instead, she was killed. Her best friend, Florence Smith, uh, to whom she had given her notes, she somehow or other just by chance died a couple days later. The notes were never found. So that's just a, a few of, of, of the dozens and hundreds of absolutely key witnesses and people involved, one way or another, tangentially, with the Kennedy assassination that were killed uh, within a few years. Statisticians have um, determined that the chance of that small, that, excuse me, that number of people uh, random people being killed in that manner um, over such a short period of time is one, the chance of that happening uh, by COVID is, is one in trillion. Trillions, okay? In other words, those people were killed off. You'd have to believe in the tooth fairy if you, didn't, if you, didn't, if you looked into this and didn't think otherwise. <clears throat> so let me uh, wrap it up. By the end of his presidency, John F. Kennedy was pointedly rejecting the warmongering and profiteering agenda of the ruling elite. The titanic view that this fearless president had entered into with the establishment was a life and death one. Only one of the combatants would survive. JFK has been called by historical observers the plutocrats' worst nightmare. They took decisive action and put an end to that nightmare. With the country henceforth firmly on their imperial course they always desired, the plutocrats have been sleeping soundly ever since. Since Kennedy's assassination, the U.S. Has, has not had a president worth a red cent. We have had, however, notable scoundrels and outright psychopaths in the nation's highest formal office. This is not by accident. The oligarchs, the true rulers of this country, watch over mere elected officials like a mafia don watches over his henchmen, not allowing any to stray from the criminal path. In the final analysis, the oligarchy controls the government through Congress. It was, it was, the, it was Congress that passed the National Security Act of 1947 that created uh, the national security state, including the CIA and the defense establishment in the first place. <coughs> and it's Congress that passes all laws and has, also has the authority to rein in all government agencies, but conspicuously neglects to do so. And I'll, I'll be finished in just a second. James Giglio tells a little story about JFK that reveals his elemental character as well as any other. While working late on a cold, bitter night, Kennedy opened the French doors of the Oval Office to tell the Secret Service guard outside, I don't want you out there in this terrible cold. When the guard insisted that such was his duty, Kennedy reappeared with a fleece-lined coat and cups of hot chocolate for both of them. A coatless president sat on the icy steps drinking hot chocolate with the guard. <clears throat> the oligarchy killed John F. Kennedy because he was deep down a truly good and courageous man. Not superhuman, just honorable. And our rulers simply cannot allow such a person to be president of their United States. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, who's got questions? Okay. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, who, okay. I'm going to put yeah, uh, I'm going to turn the projector off. Okay. Let's get a feel for how honor. much. Uh, we'll, we'll go to questions and answers. But I want to know if there's going to be 15 people here, or just what? Anybody wants to give a rebuttal? Raise your hand. Just, just one uh, last thing. While uh, Andy's kind of. We'll go to questions and answers. Yeah. Uh, this is our organization. A few of us in here are members. Uh, you can check it out at raftd.org. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, we got about 15 minutes for questions. Okay. All right. Who, who's got a question? He answered them all during um, the talk. You know, I, I, I look at this whole thing, you know, your, your conspiracy theories and grafted on the trends. 
um, yet at the same time, I'm seeing things like worldwide poverty today going down to less than 10% of the population. We're actually living longer. P people are starting, the, the world's starting to progress forward. And I attribute that to uh, free trade and globalization. Can you comment? Yeah, I'd love to comment. <clears throat> First of all, uh, conspiracy theory, that term was invented by the CIA. Okay. Literally, they came up with that term. Um, and that, to, that was to denigrate people who were uncovering what really happened uh, to, uh, with the JFK assassination. <clears throat> so the, there's overwhelming evidence. Um, there's, it's beyond question that Kennedy was assassinated by higher powers. And then that the official story of uh, Oswald doing it alone is a sheer fabrication. Okay, so that's so much for a conspiracy theory. Um, as for progress happening in the United States, um, I'm reading right now, I already have read uh, a lot about Stalinism, but I'm <coughs> looking into it again, and I'm going to, as I said, uh, do a, a presentation on that. Uh, Stalin, uh, uh, Stalin's Russia, okay, was undergoing a, a lot of progress in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, but at the same time, it was a tyranny of unimaginable uh, characteristics. I mean, it, it just—it was just—it was just beyond belief of what was happening in that in that country. The mass murder uh, and, and and the uh, clamping down of free speech and I just—I'm going to—I'll get into it later. But my point here, uh, to answer Tim's question, is that paradoxically, you can have pro progress in a country while it's a tyranny. This country is actually a tyranny. Okay, and I, I could spend the next hour going through. Uh, you know, various uh, uh, um, reasons and, and uh, indications of that, okay? But the point is that it's not a contradiction. You can have some progress in some things, okay? But still, the, the government is not right, and the system is not right, and it has to be changed. Okay. And the back. So what you're saying about Kennedy being such a good man, but isn't there also the theory, I mean, that he, or the history that he was deeply complicit with the mafia to be elected? Um, I think I may have heard something like that. I have not studied every aspect of, of Kennedy. I mean, not saying that he was perfect. He was, right. I said, I said myself he was, he was not perfect. Right. Okay. The mafia is supposed to play a part in the assassination. Yeah. yeah. Look, um, politics surrounding presidents are always very complicated. First of all, they're, they're politicians, OK? Uh, they're not saints, no, none of them, including Kennedy. Um, so uh, Kennedy might have, I don't know, there might have been some connection between Kennedy and the mob. They might have helped him. Um, there are all kinds of uh, peripheral uh, players around political figures as, as, as high as, as, a pres uh, as a presidential candidate. So there might be these kinds of connections. Uh, what the point of Kennedy is that despite uh, whatever foibles he had, whatever you know, faults and, and, and problems, uh, however much he went in, a, you know, in, 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 in the same direction as, as the establishment for political purposes, uh, you know, because you have to appease them to some degree, Finally, he put his feet down. He put his foot down, and he said, "No, I'm not going to continue this. You're not going to continue this. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you." Okay, and no other president has done that. Uh, certainly not as forcefully. Not at all. Period. Uh, but certainly not in the manner that JFK did. And that's why they killed him. They don't. They didn't kill Barack Obama. They didn't kill uh, uh, Nixon. Although they, they may have done something to get him to resign. But my point is that he was exceptional. Kennedy was exceptional, despite. Uh, his flaws and his serve. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. You say that John. Okay. okay. Yeah. You say that John Foster. John Foster Douglas Douglas would, could have been on the inside of it. John um, Foster Douglas. Yeah. He, well, no. John Foster Douglas was um, Secretary of State in the in the Eisenhower administration. By the time Kennedy. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe by the time he was elected, certainly about, I think by the time he was assassinated, John Foster Dulles was probably dead. He died uh, young, not young, but he died, um, I think, before that. Or he was retired or whatever. Not, so Foster Dulles was not uh, involved in Kennedy's assassination. Um, it was Alan Dulles, his, his younger brother. I, I'm pretty sure he was younger. Uh, he was involved, for sure. So now, John Foster Dulles was a Cold warrior. He was involved in the Iran coup, the Guatemala coup, um, all kinds of uh, Cold War incidents. Okay, 
but uh, he wasn't involved in the direct struggle between Kennedy and the establishment. Yeah, that was Alan Dulles, his brother. Oh. Yeah, yeah John Foster. He gave up the term uh, domino theory. So just the little terse terms that capture people and they believe it for some reason. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that he was the originator of that term. Yeah. <clears throat> but think about it. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Um, and and the the, law, the the flaw in the logic, okay, is that when one domino quote unquote falls, if it's not your business to begin with, what, what difference does it make how many other dominoes fall? None of them is your business. Okay. What does what does the U.S. have to do with uh, Southeast Asian nations? Uh, not nothing, okay. I, I, and as, as I said it many times during this presentation, it, it's, it's just it's just sheer uh, idiocy to think that the U.S. has a right to be uh, intervening and not just intervening, sending armies around the world to slaughter people for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Can I ask you okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you? If I may. I'm not going to. Go ahead. Okay, no go ahead. Listen, if, if uh, in this time, I, I was probably in fourth grade, maybe third grade when it was happened, mm -hmm. um, but it was panic in Russia. Uh, every republic in Russia uh, when it was happened. So, anyway, my question is if relationship between Russia and this country was so great, you know, if this Peak, you know, peak of the relationship, but the same in English. Ah, uh, no. Uh, very good relationship was in this time, in 1960, between Kennedy, like Khrushchev, adored Kennedy. So why, my question is why Russian government cannot protect Kennedy from trouble? Okay, they Russian... they one of the best friends they were. They love each other, really. Huh? They like each other very much. That, okay, that was Khrushchev and Kennedy. <clears throat> First of all, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't brothers. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't, you know, literally buddies. They had a right. special relationship. Right. Uh, but Khrushchev was uh, one person. He was the leader of, of, the nominal leader of the country, just like Kennedy was the nominal leader of the United States. But they each had their Cold War establishments. Okay? So you can't say that the United States and the Soviet Union had good relations. They had terrible relations. Okay. Uh, and these guys, these two individuals, uh, uh, were fighting, fighting through that, um, you know, nonsense to try to uh, resolve things and to try to go toward a more peaceful um, uh, relationship for, for their for their countries. But they were being opposed uh, steadfastly by their respective um, uh, military establishments. I thought Cold War started later, you know, like uh, after Brezhnev or during the Cold War. No, the Cold War. Um, I have only uh, been uh, talking about the uh, early part of the Cold War. I'm not particularly, frankly, I'm not particularly interested in what happened uh, in the late, later part of the Cold War because by that time everything had gone to pot. You know, the whole business was was, was, was totally but ridiculous. But during Khrushchev and Kennedy friendship, it was not really Cold War, right? It was in the Cold War. Really? Next question, please. Over here in the corner. Um, you talked about this, the statistical probability mm -hmm. that all those people would die accidentally after Kennedy's assassination, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't actually say the number of people who were murdered. How many people were murdered? There is no um, <clears throat> definitive answer to that. Um, some people uh, have counted um, uh, something in the 30s. Okay. Other people have come, I, I think there is, uh, somebody else counted uh, 300. Uh, it would, it, there can't be a real definitive answer to that uh, because um, people are, are um, some people are closely connected, related to uh, uh, either Kennedy or Oswald or, or closely uh, um, involved in the whole um, mess and the whole situation and, and assassination. And then there, there are, uh, and then you have like rings of people who are less and less uh, directly connected and, and there, there, there would never be a uh, firm a line where you say, okay, this person's connected, but no, you know, other people aren't. Uh, but anyway, to, to better answer your question, there are, are uh, many uh, different counts uh, of the exact number of people who were killed 
um, because of the, uh, having some connection to the assassination. Also, another thing is that um, you, it's, it's to some degree a judgment call whether somebody uh, died because of the assassination or because they just died. Um, what the statisticians uh, who have done this um, say is that people uh, suffering violent deaths uh, of the kind um, that, um, that they did suffer, uh, those kinds of deaths are not that common. You know, people don't have uh, car accidents every every day, fatal car accidents. Okay, well, for so many people to have fatal car accidents, uh, heart attacks when when, when they weren't uh, uh, diseased, um, suicides when they were not suicidal. Uh, and so many people to have those kinds of uh, uh, quote-unquote accidents who were so closely connected to uh, Kennedy, for that to uh, uh, be a chance occurrence uh, is what statisticians say um, is, um, that, that does not happen. Did that answer your question? There's no definitive answer as to the exact number. Jonathan. Yeah, Ted, thanks for a great uh, talk, as always. Thank you. Um, a lot of people would say that last year we saw a financial, a media uh, censorship or media partial uh, blackout of one of the candidates that was most popular in the primaries that was sort of an assassination of a non-violence and bloodshed kind, but also assassination. Could you uh, give your thoughts on that uh, uh, hypothesis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I said this um, here at the College of Complexes on a couple of other occasions. <coughs> uh, I, I'm certain that um, Sanders, Bernie Sanders, uh, would have been killed if he had uh, won the nomination. And um, everything, uh, they moved heaven and earth to uh, make sure that uh, Hillary Clinton was the candidate and not Bernie Sanders. And um, you saw how the media, I think we said they had a blackout. They, had, they literally had a blackout on Sanders. Uh, Bernie Sanders would have um, filled stadiums, okay, and either they, they wouldn't <coughs> cover it at all, or they'd give him a, a line or two. Uh, uh, Donald Trump would go up to an empty podium, or, or no, rather, they would they would they would they would ha uh, literally had cameras on on empty podiums waiting for Donald Trump to come to say you know some silly thing or other, okay, while um, and with nobody around, okay, while Bernie Sanders was filling stadiums, uh, and of course they they covered everything uh, Hillary Clinton had to say. Um, she, Hillary Clinton, uh, was sure she was going to win. In fact, just about everybody was sure she was going to win. They were so, they were so uh, uh, overconfident. Uh, um, it was, yeah, they, they, they took care of Bernie Sanders. And if they hadn't done it uh, the nonviolent way, uh, undoubtedly, they would have uh, eliminated it. Just as a quick follow-up, uh, that example, hypothesis, grassy knoll, Mysterious, we never found them characters. Two of them might be John Podesta and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Yeah, right. Well, I remember those two. One Any last question in the back before we go to rebuttals. So, 50 years later, uh, still the general consensus says that Oswald was the assassin. That's what the New York Times would say probably to this day, right? But they still go with that official line. Oh, uh, yeah, the official line. Um, and, you think in the, in the public now, is there like more than half would say that they believe that there was actually some kind of Yeah, I, I don't know what the number is, uh, but a huge percentage, uh, if not the majority of people, uh, believe that um, JFK was assassinated. Just like uh, a large proportion, if not the majority of people, believe that 9-11 was an inside job. But um, as with 9-11, the official line is, is, is in cement, is, is, is etched in, in, in concrete. Okay? They cannot, as the establishment, and the establishment um, media, the corporate media, cannot admit um, that Kennedy was assassinated. Okay. Because that would uh, blow up the entire myth of this, this great you know, democratic nation uh, where you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen. I mean, how would they even start to explain not only the assassination, but their cover-up? They have been covering up for a solid, uh, what is it now, uh, 20, uh, 30, uh, 50, 60 years. Okay? So they're never going to admit to, to, to the truth. Um, yeah, it's a total um, solid, um, solidly um, uh, you know, kept line. Um, no, it's one assassin. I, I, I got a question. Yeah, and, and by the way, even on quote unquote liberal progressive uh, outlets, like Tom Hartman, for instance, if, you, if anybody knows Tom yes. Hartman, and all those people on WCPT. 
Yeah. Uh, did you run across, um, I, I forget where I read it, but uh, our own government supposedly put out a report in 1979 saying that the official story was false and that he was assassinated by multiple shooters. Oh, right, right, right. There uh, was some kind of report, 79 or 1980, and, it, yeah, you know, and the yeah. media didn't cover it. Yeah, might, you might be talking, is it one of those commissions, maybe the church commissioners or uh, church, what is it called, commission? Oh, no, house investigative, whatever. Uh, okay. It's one of those investigations. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, <clears throat> but those um, uh, quote-unquote investigations, um, they were, very uh, mediocre, and they didn't dig seriously uh, uh, as they as they could have and, and, and should have. And what they concluded and admitted was not that uh, the CIA or, or, or the U.S. government or the establishment, much less the establishment, killed Kennedy. What they said was, well, you just said this is as far as they'll go. Oh well, there was probably more than you know, just Oswald. But no, they, they they're not going to tell you the story. They might uh, uh, see that there's there's this term called limited hangout. In, in conspiracy, uh, among conspiracy people uh, that, that study conspiracy, the government cannot, um, uh, will not necessarily give you a, a, a complete blanket uh, no. They'll say, well, they, they'll qualify, okay, and, and they'll go to a, a secondary position that is more plausible than, than the uh, you know solid official story. So that's what uh, that's what this, this um, investigative body, House Commission or whatever it was called, did. They didn't, they didn't and would never explain exactly what happened. And by the way, I just want to say one more thing. Um, it, it, the, the analogy uh, uh, with um, uh, JFK um, uh, in, in modern terms, uh, or rather the, the, the analogy with Bernie Sanders, I'm sorry, is Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, because Bernie Sanders was not the president. Bernie Sanders was the Democratic candidate for the president, just as uh, Robert Kennedy was about to become the um, the uh, Democratic candidate president. They killed him literally on the night he was, uh, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, winning uh, the uh, Democratic uh, um, candidacy. So the, the uh, correct analogy is between Bernie Sanders and Robert F. Kennedy. I believe we go to rebuttals. You want to go to rebuttals? Yes. Give our speaker a hand. <laughs> Okay, uh, let us have a show of hands, please, about who wants to give a rebuttal. We'll get a count, and then we'll figure out how many minutes everybody gets. One, two, three. So these three guys get 12 minutes apiece, is that right? No, that'd be more. A little humor there, folks. Go with the uh, There's only three people that want to say something tonight here. Uh, oh, I'm sure that's that'd be okay. more. Uh, Jonathan's one. You know, Jonathan will have the first one. It looks like. I don't have, I have no second. One. Actually, I prefer if there's a female member who wants to go. A female member always gets to go first. It's okay. my preference. Any female members want to go first? If not, uh, I'll take the first. So okay. Uh, what not, do we got? Six people. I'll one go. Oh. We, have we got about six people. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Oh, so, well, yeah, we're running a little late on time, too. All right. Yeah, go four minutes like we usually do. All right. Try to be concise in four minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's right there. It's just hit the Oh, here? Hang on. I'll get it. Okay, now we'll take it away. You see, I like, first off, I got to compliment you. You did a very good presentation. Mm -hmm. I think it was well researched, had a lot of facts and credibility, but I think your conclusions about America and the pessimism you provide are absolutely wrong. You see, our country was founded upon freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, and fundamentally human rights. All men were created equal. Now I understand we did have the legacy of slavery. We did have other things, but over the last arc of some 225, or two, I'm sorry, maybe 235 years, we have improved. We have seen, uh, we have seen the, the end of 
discrimination, and although there still are some vestiges of it. We, <laughs> oh my have, God. We have seen women's suffrage come through. We have seen women get into the workplace. And plus, we have increased our wealth tremendously. And the way that's done is through trade and capitalism. If there's one thing that I would warn Trump against, where he would make America last instead of America first, is if he cuts off globalization and free trade. That single entity and engine has been responsible for most of the world getting better over the last 200, 250 years. Remember, the natural state of most economies 250 years ago was that everybody was poor. Everybody was a dirt farmer. And yet, through the Industrial Revolution, the proliferation of transportation and the pro pro proliferation of communications has made our world a much better place, a much greater place to live. It has been said recently that you guys are all wondering how to get rid of third world poverty and that it may have been increased. Well, the problem, the thing is, we're down to less than 13% on a worldwide basis. Many of us are living much, much longer when it used to be 100 years ago, 40 was the norm. In most of your advanced countries, it's now closer to 70. We've seen the elimination of a lot of diseases around the world, a, de a decrease in infant mortality, and a lot of it's been because we've been able to trade and talk to each other over the last few years. Now with the proliferation of the internet and other technologies, the world's going to want to develop. The third world is going to want to develop. And what kills me about a lot of the people with climate change and all this is that they want to say, stop. We'll do it all with wind and solar, which, my friends, is probably the biggest scam I've ever heard in my life. Intermittency. It's going to take an all of the above strategy. I know many of you have heard my views on thorium nuclear power before and the new advanced gen four reactors as a component of that strategy. The thing that the United States, I think, really needs to do is to get back to its roots, get back to work, start trading on a fair basis. Because what many of you don't know is that the United States sometimes just hands the keys to the kingdom to another country. For example, how many of you have cell phones out there? Huh? How many of you have cell phones? What's a cell phone? How many of you have like <laughs> how many of you have like those touch screen computers? They all operate on a little something called can I have another minute or two? Yeah. They all operate on something called rare earths. Rare earth elements. And right now the only country that's even selling them or mining or, or mining them on an active basis is China. We were the country that developed it. China came in and put, sold them at loss to around the world. Our mines closed. And even most of your military equipment, most of your other advanced electronics are, are based on rare earth metals. This is one example where we have handed our keys to the kingdom, literally to the Chinese, gave up our intellectual property, and you know, if you want free trade, you're going to have to have fair trade as well. The only way we're going to get out of this debacle with China is to basically pool our resources, put the... Anyway, but that's a long story short. In short, sometimes we become anti-competitive and, and sometimes we do get taken advantage of and it's our own damn fault when we just give away things to people. Now, on the positive note, the United States is still probably one of the most innovative countries in the world. A few reforms to get it a little better might be the best way to proceed forward. But Mr. Trump, don't close your, don't shut down globalization. Mr. Trump, don't impede the people beforehand. Mr. Trump, tear down this wall. Thanks, Ted.
Uh, the uh, hypothesis that I'd like to present this evening is that there was another assassination last year. It's just done far more stealthy, stealthier ways by very, very wealthy, powerful, influential, status-occupying uh, individuals who, uh, we don't hear their names often, but I mentioned two of them, uh, John Podesta and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And I could name some more, Tim Geithner, Larry Summers, Rahm Emanuel, uh, you know the list. Uh, what was the equivalent then in my hypothesis of the Sapruder film? Well, I would say it's WikiLeaks. I would say it's Seth Rich. I would say it's Sean Lucas. I would say it was Bernard Wisenant. I would say it's independent journalists, independent attorneys, independent engineers that came to unusual and sudden and very mysterious, highly questionable, very poorly explained by the local authorities deaths last year. Uh, so go to electionjustice.org, go to truthdig.org and see the Robert Shear interview with Thomas Frank at the convention. Go to georgewebb.com and you'll see why I say that. And I know you say, well, John, you, you, you're, you're making the where there's smoke, there's fire argument. What if that house happens to be no fire at all? Just a thousand people are smoking the cigars and pipes and cigarettes on that evening. Okay, fine. That you know, might be possibly what happened. You know, I'm, I'm not saying those episodes of certainty I know what happened. I just know that in American history there's a lot of these where there's smoke, there's fire uh, things that never get solved, but it always happens with the people who had the opportunity to make sure that the footprints never led back to them happen to gain the power, gain the wealth, gain the influence, gain the status, gain the luxury, gain the access after it happens, just coincidentally. Uh, and you know, this is personal for me, because my father died in 1996 in Dallas, Texas, and he was a Catholic, and he was a liberal as well. So I'm sorry, I can't be objective in this topic. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is the last one that I'm going to talk about. It's called The People's We Deas. We'll keep on walking all over till we know. Where on, by the way, this is for Bernie Sanders and all the Bernie Sanders voters. We'll keep on walking all over till we know. Where on earth they recognize soul. We'll keep on talking about it till it's known. That our voices free are not alone. We'll keep on calling out till all know that on this planet all have a home. We won't be falling for it, the king's or queen's gold. We'll keep on over and over, the powers and we the people, the future's wide open. And that's a block party. That's a family reunion for everybody. That's a barbecue on Saturday. That's a picnic on the weekend on Sunday. That's a music fest. That's a protest. That's an action in the middle of the square. A march going all the hours. And not just wait until the new comes along. Not just great food, spirit, and songs. No, no, a lot more than that. The people's ideas for a peaceful world. A loving, equal, transparent world. The people's ideas of a just, livable, cooperating world. The people's ideas for a natural world. The people's ideas for an independent world. A conscious, sharing, beautiful world. The people's ideas of a better world. Another world, a worker's world, a habitable world. The people's ideas for an understanding, healthy, coexisting world, an evolved, equ equitable, accessible world. The people's ideas for a nurturing world, a caring, inclusive, respectful world. The people's idea for a fair world, a sustainable, tolerant, honest, responsible world. The people's ideas for an accountable world, a neighborly world a human world. The people's ideas of a civilized world are all of this, us are in this together kind of world. A we the people feel it, but there's no name for it yet world. Let's call it something new then, a we the people volution world. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, JFK. Thanks for the talk. I liked it. Uh, in spirit, basically, I support a lot of the stuff that you said. Uh, I've read about uh, Guatemala and the Congo and Vietnam, and it's a pretty sad history for the U.S. Um, uh, I do have uh, 
uh, I do disagree with you about your, your basic idea that uh, the Soviet Union, you started out on a really bad note for me personally in saying that the Soviet Union was not really, I forgot how you said it, but not into aggression. They didn't want to expand their territory. <coughs> the world, the world, the world. So, um, uh, being, I, I love to read history, and I'm not an expert, but um, after reading a lot about World War II, I don't know how many people here know this. Um, uh, 1939, Nazi Germany had an agreement with Stalin to split up parts of Europe and to not fight each other. It's a non-aggression pact. They split up half of Poland. Um, Russia got uh, Finland, uh, parts of Romania, uh, the country that's now called uh, Moldovia, and um, and then uh, Russia got the uh, eastern half of Poland, and Nazi Germany got the western half. And um, and after a couple of years, uh, Hitler being greedy said he wanted uh, more, so he invaded Russia, which we I think most people have heard about. <coughs> Uh, so uh, the Poles kind of had a choice, not a very good choice. The Nazis are attacking us from the, from the, from their east. The Russians are taking over from their west. Who do they pick? So uh, because uh, Joe, Uncle Joe, as Roosevelt used to like to call Joe Stalin, didn't have a lot of choices, he tried to buddy up with Churchill and and Roosevelt and succeeded, so a lot of Poles went with the Western powers, supposedly. Well, which meant that they went over to Russia to try to get help. Well, what did Joe do? Joe uh, took a lot of their leaders, especially a lot of the military leaders, and he executed them. Tens of thousands of them. Um, I think the it was called the Katrina, Katrina Massacre, was that it? Correct, okay. So, uh, uh, this uh, did not sit well with the Poles. So, uh, but there really wasn't much they could do about it. So Russia did a great job of pushing, uh, fighting against the Nazis. They were hugely supplied by the United States through um, their south and their north. Uh, and, um, uh, and when they finally got to Moscow, they stopped. All the, all the, the Polish partisans were fighting the Nazis. And Joe's, Joe Stalin, his strategy was, you know what, we'll just let them fight on their own for a while. And he just let them get slaughtered by the Nazis before he invaded. And then there was, uh, of course, after the war, there was the whole Berlin Wall thing. Uh, I just am not buying, and I, I, I personally just find it a little insulting that somebody would think that they're not into expand the rep, the USSR was not into expanding their territory and I think this is important today because if you hear of how Putin talks he really believes that the disbandment of the of the Soviet Union was the worst thing to happen to Russia and he's been trying to rectify that by invading he's invaded uh, Moldova he's invaded everyone knows about the Ukraine that was recent <coughs> And he's invaded Georgia twice, and he's taken territory from all of them yep. to expand. See, the Russian is agreeing with me, so I'm not making any mistakes. So this is this is an old world attitude, and a lot of and there's a chunk of people in Russia who are actually worshiping Joe Stalin now, like he's a deity. So <coughs> it's it's a, it's a concern, and I just wanted to address that. And uh, but thanks for the rest of your talk. And we got next three butter. Oh. Good evening. This is not exactly a rebuttal. I'm finally convinced it was not the Cubans or the Mafia that did John Kennedy in. And last week, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, was a, it was a good presentation. And uh, I spoke to my niece's uh, husband today, and he said it was not. If it took planes to hit the towers, it was missiles. There's no plane could go 500 miles at that altitude. That it was too thick. And then I think it was Nancy Olson. She made, she made a. They say she made a phone call that there were Muslims with uh, box cutters 
And he said that you can't make a cell phone from, once the airplane starts going, you can't make a cell phone. Now, is that true? You can't uh, make a cell you phone can from make calls. Airplane. You can make calls. You cell can? Phone. You yeah, can. Yeah, from altitude. At higher altitude? Higher altitude going fast in 2009. But, but, but they were at a low altitude, I think, when they crashed yeah. in Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, labor, uh, Union Debs. I, uh, Union Debs was, uh, he didn't, nobody mentioned when he was born. He was born in Terre Haute, Coast, Indiana. He died in El, El, Elmhurst, Illinois. Very close. Uh, he spent his whole life uh, very close to Chicago. And, and the first time you, you know, ran for president five times at Eugene Debs. And um, first time he got about 100,000 votes. The last time he got about a million votes. And when he was in prison, he was so well liked there that, it, it was, uh, that, that they let the, all 2,000 uh, inmates come out in Praise you mean Debs when they were leaving. Two thousand were left out of their cells. And uh, uh, here, uh, I think that sometimes that Charlie, I don't know it's about Charlie, a couple, about two or three weeks ago, he said that are those pajamas. Twice he said they were shorts. They were not pajamas. I don't know what's with Charlie. And uh, the numbers on the uh, they're way up there. It's like the numbers of the uh, sessions are completely off, where it's, it's about 60, a little over 66 and a half years, he's got him up, 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 over 68, 68 and three quarters years, he got him up about 200, um, to, to, uh, uh, one or 200 off-centered, and uh, Charlie's always with the conspiracy and the politics, you know, and, and uh, I got this stuff here. Drugs and chemo, uh, chemtrails, and if they really going to go to conspiracy, I don't know if they ever had the, what about the Marilyn Monroe conspiracy? Did she commit suicide or, or, or was she assassinated? Marilyn Monroe, and also Mary Lanza. You may not heard about Mary Lanza. I think the mafia did Mary Lanza in because he was years ago. He was he owed uh, fifty thousand dollars in gambling debts. He was supposed to. Come to, uh, uh, several times a single over in Las Vegas and never showed up. I think Mary Alonzo was uh, done in by the mafia. And, uh, uh, and uh, we, should, we could have different topics here. Like on uh, Saturday before uh, at the Oscars, we could have spoken, spoken about, uh, uh, what, about the movies. Who would win the Oscars or what favorite movies or so. And, uh, and the quotations, like, uh, what's the most dangerous work? I just found, to, just this past week, that nursing is a very dangerous job. Yeah, sure. That uh, a lot of, uh, they're being overdosed, so you got to be very careful if you go to a nursing home. I know a fellow that he was burnt. He went to a nursing home, he was a nasty guy, and he had burn marks. It, oh, he, uh, they were burning him. An idea is about quotations. What, what, what is your philosophy like for quotations like um, Rise and Shine or something like that? What is your quotation? Or, uh, on, um, on, uh, on comedy, who is the greatest comedian up here? About humor, sports. They had uh, uh, last week about sports. They uh, talk, talk about the. I spoke about concussions over here and how to speed up uh, baseball and uh, science, but discoveries, you know, inventions, what's well, the greatest invention of the 20th century? I heard it was the transistor. Oh, yeah. Without the transistor, <coughs> nothing would go. So uh, back, I forget who invented it, the three guys, then the, the transistor, the greatest invention of the 20th century. Okay, that's it. Mm. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ted, for another excellent performance, uh, presentation, and as always, you're trying to cram 50 pounds of potatoes into a 10-pound sack, right? And uh, after you drive away, you forget, you know, well, there's just no time to cover everything. How you guys doing back there? You got a question? 
story anyway. Um, I'd like to say one thing. Um, I came to the conclusion that the military was not fighting for freedom and justice when I spent two years in Vietnam. And after I came out, uh, you know, Ted has, has confirmed what I always believed. I've been telling people since then that these wars we have every now and then is essentially an after Christmas sale. Like uh, in peacetime, uh, Target or uh, Sears or all the other stores, uh, when the shelves are full, they dump stuff on sale. You know, you have to have a sale to get rid of the old merchandise to reorder and restocking the shelves with new stuff. Well, with the military, if your shelves are all full with bombs and missiles and everything else in peacetime, and you have every soldier has four pairs of boots waiting in six uniforms and they're fully stocked, well, you have after, after Christmas sale. You have to dump some of that stuff on a country in order to get more orders coming in. So <coughs> Vietnam was basically a dumping ground. That is nowhere better described than in General Smedley Butler's book, War is a Racket, published in 1935 after Butler retired. Butler said he wasn't, he learned, you know, after he got out with perspective and could look back, he wasn't really defending American freedom and justice. He was high priced muscle for the mob. He wasn't talking about the mafia. He was talking about the United Fruit Company and Standard Oil and these companies that were dominating and stealing resources in countries that objected to our businesses. Um, you know, our businesses have a philosophy. Or, I mean, most of you have heard the term, it's not personal, it's just business. And it's, it's not personal, it's just, we, you know, it, 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 we don't have anything against you Vietnamese people personally, but we have to conduct an operation here where we drop a few hundred thousand tons of bombs. So if you'll clear the land and just let us drop the bombs and have, have the uh, military operation going on so our friends in Congress can reappropriate more money for these civilian companies that make this stuff, then nobody has to die. But if, you're, if you want to continue to think that you can occupy your country while our operation is going on, well, some of you are going to get killed. It's not personal, it's just business. Today, 50 years later, we have the, the heads of the drug companies, the pharmaceutical industry, saying, I'm sorry your child is dying because you can't afford the medicine, but as the owner of the company, I need my billions. Uh, we make a bottle of pills for twenty dollars, sell it for ten thousand. That, that that's the uh, the goal of capitalism is to maximize profits. If we don't have anything against your children dying. It's nothing personal. It's just business. And we're the only country on earth that allows that philosophy in the medical community. Take a uh, spend an afternoon in the emergency room because a dislocated shoulder. One of our friends had that recently. Uh, a twelve-hour bill for the emergency room came to twenty-two thousand dollars. Well, it just uh, sell your house to pay for the bill. No, no big deal. Then you can just move into a homeless shelter. That's where we are today, and that's what we've got for a corporate criminal who is widely acknowledged to be a corporate criminal, currently masquerading as our president, and he has appointed other corporate criminals to run the heads. As one person said, Trump said he was going to drain the swamp. Well, he's been picking really good swamp creatures out of the swamp <laughs> and bringing them to Washington. And people that can't see that are maintaining themselves in what, <clears throat> what Project Censored every year refers to as a media-generated bubble of ignorance. This book describes how the media their job is to maintain people in a bubble of terrifying ignorance on certain subjects. So that the 28th edition, 2000, the 2018 edition is coming out in two weeks. If you only can buy one book a year, I would suggest this one. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, wants any other information, uh, feel free to see me after the talk tonight. Uh, our speaker gets the last word if there's nobody else that uh, really wants to give a rebuttal. It looks like there isn't, so come on okay. up, Ted. And Ted, the last we'll word. We'll gamble us out of here in the next five, six, okay. ten minutes. Okay. <clears throat>
Okay. <clears throat> thanks for your comments, everybody. And um, also, thanks for putting up with my coughing and sniffling. I, I really can't talk all that long. <laughs> I can write forever. But uh, um, anyway, um, I have a slight respiratory issue. But anyway, uh, what's your name, sir? David. David, okay. <clears throat> Um, in my last presentation, I talked about the issue that you brought up uh, um, a lot more. Um, and the way I would answer the, what you, your point is that uh, I make a very clear and strong distinction between regional uh, conflicts or regional involvements versus worldwide in involvements. And the Soviet Union uh, had a very uh, um, understandable problem on its eastern flank, or rather on its western flank, uh, where Eastern Europe is. They had been invaded from those countries uh, twice in a few decades, um, you know, World War I and World War II, and they had all, all, almost been destroyed on both occasions. So they had a, uh, what's called a um, uh, sphere of influence, interest, uh, that pretty much all nations, most nations, especially you know, large, powerful nations, all have. Okay? Um, I'm not excusing that. I'm just saying that that's uh, something different from, and that's why I pointed out uh, on the globe, the United States is here. It's going literally to the other side of the world. There is no point on earth that the US uh, doesn't feel like it ha its interest is, 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 is there and that it has uh, the right to um, intervene, and not just intervene, but send armies to these places. The Soviet Union wasn't sending armies all over the world at all, okay? Uh, not by any stretch. It, uh, it, uh, it, was, it was involved in uh, protecting its uh, western uh, uh, buffer zone. Now, you know, that's, that wasn't a, wasn't a nice and neat and, 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 and wonderful thing, but it's more understandable than the kind of aggression that the U.S. does. I made a very, not only now in this presentation, but especially in the last one, I made a point of, of that distinction. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, let me see, Tim, uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I am not against capitalism, and neither was Kennedy, as, as I mentioned. Um, I have no issue with free enterprise, the entrepreneurial spirit, innovation. The thing is, those things can go on in the United States uh, despite uh, repression, despite our political system, not necessarily because of it. Uh, just like, I, as I pointed out, with the Soviet Union, uh, which had um, the Stalinist tyranny, Stalin was literally slaughtering millions of, of people for no good reason, and, um, <clears throat> and and yet they had some kind of, you know, some forms of progress, economic progress. So you can have uh, um, all kinds of uh, good policies, economic policies, and, and this is the thing that, that uh, I, one of the issues I have with socialism, okay? Socialism, just, just like uh, um, you know, a, cap, a lot of capitalists, uh, focus on the economy, okay? And then, and, then, and then they get into this contest between who has the highest standard of living, who, who has, you remember in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the U.S. kind of talking about we have more TVs and, and refrigerators than the Soviets, therefore we're superior. Okay? There are much more important things about a society than the uh, little uh, material uh, gadgets that they have. Okay? Uh, so um, I would say that uh, uh, what we need to do is focus on the political system, whether in the Soviet Union or the United States or anywhere else, because freedom uh, is not ultimately an economic um, uh, thing. Okay, it's uh, the ability to have power. It's, it's having power to over your over your uh, country, over your society, over your community. Uh, ordinary people having power, and uh, that's uh, independent of, of the economic uh, um, questions. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, John, uh, <clears throat> I, I like you, what you said about the people's ideas, the people's world, the, the need for that. Okay. But, uh, and, and now you know when I, what I would probably say to that. Uh, that's all great and necessary and, and good to hear uh, and, and a terrific um, impetus, a terrific uh, 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 goal. Uh, but we, and you know this as well as I do, 
but, but we need a new political system to make that happen. We, we can't just uh, uh, talk about it. We certainly can't uh, just scream about it in the streets like so many of these people like to do running around. Uh, that, you know, that's not going <clears> to <throat> take do what needs to be done. That's not going to get what needs to be done, which, which is what you mentioned, uh, uh, an actual people's world. That requires a different political system entirely than the one that we have. And that's what um, uh, our uh, website uh, at RAFD.org, uh, the Revolutionary Alliance for Truth and Democracy, that's what uh, we talk about in, uh, uh, um, there. Uh, I, we outline uh, an entire new, different kind of political system, an actual democratic political system. Uh, that's what we need, and that's what uh, I always um, emphasize. Uh, finally, finally um, I just want to mention <coughs> that uh, both the JFK assassination and 9-11 uh, were deep state false flags, okay? And as such, uh, they were not like ordinary run-of-the-mill daily, yearly um, electoral politics, okay? These things were correctives, large-scale, profound correctives to the direction the country was going. Um, it, around the year 2000, uh, around the time of 9-11, um, the, uh, the, the oligarchy, uh, the neocons, uh, wanted to go in a, in, a, in a more imperialist, militarist direction. They wanted to uh, take over the Middle East, right? Uh, so they had to uh, 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 concoct this false flag to do that, okay? Uh, so these uh, are uh, large-scale, uh, what I call meta-phenomena, uh, these, these major false flags like 9-11. JFK, the JFK assassination, were the same, the same uh, basic thing, changing the, the direction of the country. JFK was going, uh, very broadly speaking, in a leftward direction. Okay, he wasn't a raving, uh, you know, radical communist. Okay, but he was going in a progressive, uh, truly progressive direction, which didn't match the desires and goals uh, of the elite. So they had to correct that. And um, it, like I said, it's no accident that no other president uh, ever since has uh, bucked the system, um, has, has seriously uh, challenged the oligarchy's power. So forget about uh, these, not forget, okay, we don't want to forget, but uh, you know, the, the, the uh, questions about Trump and, and Bush, or even, and even Clinton and Obama, those guys are lackeys, okay? Uh, if and when they stray, Okay, they are taken care of. Uh, and things like the 9-11 uh, assassination demonstrate that there is somebody higher, uh, way higher in power, above the, uh, the run-of-the-mill bullcrap electoral shit. Okay? Um, and, and we have to understand that. Um, the Rockefellers uh, were certainly uh, in that group. The Morgans, uh, there are others. Um, I, don't, you know, I certainly don't have a complete and definitive list. Um, and, but we don't, need, we don't even need them. We know that there are higher powers. You don't have to name them, and, and as Charlie wants, bring them into court. They're not gonna, you're not going to ever get those guys in court. Okay? Uh, you have to change the entire system, um, which allows those people to have that kind of power. Thanks. Okay. Ted, just go ahead. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, College of Complexes is adjourned for tonight, and we will see you next Saturday night on uh, September 23rd. Tonight's the 16th, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.